Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Oak Norton with Scripture Notes, and our special guest today is Abraham Gileadi. And this is, uh, I think, the third time we've had you on, Abraham. Uh, I Something think like that. Oak, okay, yeah, it's great. So, it's great always to be on your show. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you, and thanks for being here today. Um, I Thank thought you. we'd start off. I know you've got this conference coming up, and. Um, so I want to make sure that we let everybody know about that. If you want to talk for a minute about that, uh, I think that would be really helpful for people to know uh, when that is and how to sign up. And I'll post a link to the conference in the notes for this video when it goes live on YouTube. And I'll put a little uh, tag banner under it as well. All right. Thank you. Yes, we have a conference, the Isaiah Institute Conference. The second one, we had one in August last year, and it's on the 30th of March on Easter weekend, which is a Saturday that we're having it. And we have six speakers lined up, including myself. And then we have a question and answer session with me uh, live that Saturday evening. So we have two sessions, Saturday uh, morning and afternoon. Um, the I guess the talks will take about 40 minutes each. There are all aspects of the Day of Judgment that's coming, so it's called uh, A Day of Reckoning is the name of the conference. Uh, the coming cataclysm is also part of my talk. And uh, my talk is based on Isaiah's four themes of apostasy, judgment, restoration, salvation. And so I cover pretty well the whole field of Isaiah in that one talk uh, on those four themes, um, starting with the bad news and ending up with very good news So from Isaiah. So yeah, that's basically it. Okay, great. I just put a uh, link in the chat for anyone that's interested. It's bookofmormonisaiah.com slash join. That'll take you straight to the sign-up page for the conference. Well, thank you, Oak. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we can mention it again again at the end for anybody else that uh, has joined on um, at that point. So um, I wanted to talk to you, Abraham, about a couple of topics. Uh, you know, the eclipse is obviously one thing that's on a lot of people's minds coming up. There's the eclipse. There's an alignment of planets happening right now. I know um, in Isaiah, uh, he talks about, um, you know, the sun will be blocked out uh, along with the moon and stars, which is from the destruction of Babylon. But um, symbolically, uh, an eclipse is the, the sun being blocked out. And yeah. I don't know if you've got any uh, sp specific thoughts on that. Some people describe it as like a, a day of judgment. And, you know, with this one, seven years after uh, the the last one that crossed over Independence, Missouri, this one's going to cross over the other direction, make an X there. And I've seen, maybe you've seen images online. The eclipse last year um, was actually a little bit more southerly route. So it with the three eclipses passing over America, it kind of looks like a Hebrew Aleph. And I don't know if you've thought about that much or seen that image or what it may portend, but... Uh, he is the Aleph and Omega, the Aleph and Omega, right? So, um, Aleph and Tav in Hebrew, Alpha and Omega in, in Greek, yeah. So yeah, of course, um, Isaiah talks about the blackening of the sun. And I would say that an eclipse is definitely a sign of the kind that the Nephites saw. And then they saw them, and after a while, and they thought they were important. After a while, they stopped being important to them and didn't believe in them anymore. But I, I think an X over the U.S., that's that dramatic. has got to be a sign from God. And and I think the lunar eclipse is more, more of a sign for the Jews, because they, they're, the Jews are always associated with, with the moon and, and God's people of America with the sun. So, yeah, I would definitely take notice of that and expect that this year would, or the time following this eclipse, would definitely, you know, show signs of that, of, of God's coming judgment upon us. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. It's, it's already, in a way, beginning to happen. But there are a lot of things that are just in the wind. You hear, you hear them that are just around the corner that, you know, could pose some serious problems for this nation. So... Yeah. Yeah. We've definitely got some serious, serious things brewing in America right now. Um, mm. Are there any, uh, are there any references that you can think of that talk about um, 
I, I, there's there's a lot of references to like the sun will be dark and the moon turn to blood and stars fall from heaven, which uh, could just be indications of battle. Uh, the sun gets darkened out and missiles are raining down. It looks like shooting stars and things. Um, in terms of the eclipse, so uh, they happen regularly. And, and like you said, this one right over the America, seven years apart, does seem to portend something of a, a sign. It's, it's very, very graphic, yeah. But but the uh, the kind of darkness and gloom and doom, basically gloom, doomsday for the for the wicked of the earth, <laughs> for sinners that don't repent when given warning, that is more in nature of a world war. It seems very obvious from, from Isaiah that it's a world war that, that's launched by an end-time king of Assyria. And, and the weapons of mass destruction that he uses when he talks about cities destroyed and blown into dust in an instant and things like that. So that that time is still future, uh, but we're given plenty of warning for that. So, And also the words of Isaiah, when we learn them, they can really teach us, you know, the whole sequence of things and, and what we must do to prepare for that and, and, and live on through that ordeal and, and escape it as the Lord has prepared a way of escape into the millennial age uh, and to experience the joys of Jesus' presence during that beautiful and prolonged millennial age that's coming, a new paradise upon the earth. So, yeah, this is all very portending stuff for sure. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it's always fun to uh, see an eclipse as well. It's, um, I know people that uh, experienced the last one and, and drove to be in the full eclipse path uh, talked about it and just feeling like a spiritual experience, just having that it's sort of peace actually come upon them. Um, but yeah, I can, I can see that you know, when the sun is blocked, it is kind of like uh, symbolic of we don't have light from the sun. It, it does feel like kind of a judgment motive motif um it's but like, it also it also has a silver lining does it not it, it, it come, the sun comes yeah. back mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely okay so um thank you for your thoughts on that i i know you had uh also talked about possibly talking about the reversal of circumstances for the the gentiles and house of israel and i in our last encounter here uh some months ago um, there was a question, I remembered it, I, I couldn't formulate it while we were talking at the time, um, but it's in these chapters which you had brought up, which for those of you that didn't see that uh, in the announcement, um, we we're going to talk a little about 3 Nephi 16, 20, and 21. And in these chapters, as I was uh, studying them, Abraham, uh, the one thing that stuck out to me, and I, I did a, a little... Uh, browser find you know the the word father appears 54 times in these three chapters i don't know that there's any other concentration in scripture where jesus references the father so many times that it's his work and as i was looking at these uh, verses there's one in in first nephi 14 17 where nephi is he's having his encounter with the angel and um, he says, when the, the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil, then at that day, the work of the father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are of the house of Israel. So I was like, again, the it's the father's work. And there's some really interesting things when you put these chapters side by side that you can see parallels, but it's like um, 3 Nephi 16 uh, contains sort of like the, the Gentile America um, story. I, I'm not sure the way to say it. And then uh, chapter 20 is, is like what's going on in Jerusalem, but there's like verses that are identical, almost identical between them and one of them here, if I can, I'm just going to share my screen real quick. I'd love to have your uh, comment on this. Let me share this. And I apologize for all the uh, bright, vibrant colors here. Um, this is just me going crazy uh, with my marking scheme. But 
Um, right here in this column is 3 Nephi 16. And in verses 18, 19, and 20, it's very similar to um, right here in chapter 20, verses 32, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, both of them talking about the watchmen lift up their voice with the voice together. They'll sing, see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring Zion. Uh, over here in verse or chapter 20, it says the father will gather them together again and give them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. And they'll break forth in joy. The waste places of Jerusalem are both mentioned. Um, but in this case, it says the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And over here, it's the Father hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God over here on the left and of the Father, and the Father and I are one. And so... Yeah. Can yes, you... and, and those chapters, those quotes are from Isaiah 52. Mm -hmm. He repeats them in Isaiah, I mean, in 3 Nephi 20. What he said in... 3 Nephi 16, the day before, to the Nephites, he repeats the next day in 3 Nephi 20. And then expands upon that in 3 Nephi 21. Yes. Again, mentioning chap chapter 52 is the big one that's that Jesus is referring to in these, in so, these discourses. So can you talk for a minute, I, in a lot of your writings, you, you've explained the uh, emperor vassal model where there's like the the father is like the emperor, and and then Christ is like the vassal king. His authority is put on him, and he comes down to do his work and his will. And and just in reading uh, these chapters, there's uh, at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven things that I saw right away where the father commanded Jesus to do something, um, to visit his lost sheep, to fulfill the covenant that the father made with the house of Israel, um, it says when the Gentiles reject the gospel, uh, then it'll go to the house of Israel. He commands them to give this land, America, for the land of their inheritance. Uh, the Father commands him to gather the people that the Father's covenanted with and make them strong, which I assume would be priesthood power. Um, commands that uh, the house of Israel to be established, commands Christ to establish them and to bless the house of Israel in turning away from their iniquities. And I was wondering if you could just kind of express your view on how has the Father co covenanted with the house of Israel? To me, it's like a pre-mortal covenant, because in the Old Testament, it's Jehovah that's doing the covenanting. And I, I, I'm not as familiar with all of the, uh, uh, the covenant stuff that takes place in the Old Testament as you are. So I'm just wondering, like, what would be your perspective on the difference here between, like, the Father covenanting with Israel and Christ as Jehovah covenanting with Israel? Yes. First of all, I think, Oak, that is a really wonderful uh, observation that you've made, that the Father is mentioned so many times in these chapters where Jesus is speaking. And that, you know, it is almost like now the Father personally is going to get involved. Uh, and there are three individuals involved here, actually, in the whole redemptive end time scenario, uh, where he's quoting Isaiah. Uh, again, uh, both Nephi and Jacob and Jesus all quote Isaiah when they speak about the end time. And so that's really important. Um, uh, the third individual is a servant whom we we see in um, 3 Nephi 21 when he starts speaking about his servant there. But he's also spoken of in chapter 52. The servant who is marred, and then he Jesus heals him. He says in thirty five twenty one. So yes, so it's like the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I don't know who the servant is. I'm not speculating there either, but it's they're all one, you know. And then, like you mentioned, there is that emperor vassal kind of hierarchy, where the the um, that follows a pattern from ancient Near Eastern emperor vassal covenants, so that the vassal king in this case. If the father was the emperor, so to speak, or, or the emperor symbolized the father, then Jesus would be his vassal. And the vassal obeys the law of the emperor, and then the emperor uh, blesses the vassal and all that the vassal does, so to speak. But then Jesus himself is also the father, as 
as uh, Abinadi would say, and as uh, who uh, um, Samuel the Lamanite was it? Was it Samuel? Who was it that um, said that the? No, it was Amulek. The father is the. The Jesus is the father. The very the son of God is the very father, um, and so. But he's the father of. Then he himself is an emperor to those, to his vassals, namely the servant and other servants that he has. So there's a hierarchy of father and son relationships. So they're all correct. Um, and mentioning the father and the son, I was looking through these chapters and studying them. And you know what the most important theme of these chapters is? And that everything is geared toward that? It is the fulfilling of the Father's or the Lord's covenant with the house of Israel. And that whole scenario has never gotten started and cannot start until the time is right, until the Lord's own due time. And when is that? Well, in the meantime, the gospel, you know, was restored. Well, first of all, it went to the Gentiles after the Jews rejected Jesus. And then it was restored again through the prophet Joseph Smith after the Gentiles apostatized. And, and now the Gentiles are, going, are given it that last chance through the servant who comes to the Gentiles, says in Isaiah, his mission is to the Gentiles. They are given a final last chance to get it together. And fortunately, some do, and they carry it to the house of Israel. So it's really important for us to, to know where we, we fit into this scheme of things. Who are we? Are we the house of Israel? As, no. We're identified as the Gentiles in these scriptures, in the Book of Mormon, and also in Isaiah. But there is a redeeming factor, and that is that some of us, you know, carry the gospel to the house of Israel, which by definition in the Book of Mormon or wherever you look, are the Jews, the ten tribes, and those who are the Lehi's descendants of today. So once you get, you know, that straight of, of who is who, then you know, then you can know what your role is and where we fit into this scheme of things. So yes, the Gentiles as a whole in these chapters clearly reject the gospel after, sometime after they've received it, after they've received it through the prophet of Jerusalem. Sometime later, namely right now or soon, they reject it and then there's that reversal of circumstances where mm -hmm. it goes back to the Jews, ten tribes, to the natural branches of the house of Israel. The opposite of what happened in Jesus' day when the Jews rejected it and it went to the Gentiles, and the apostles carried it to the Gentiles. And now, you know, these servants that I mentioned in Isaiah, likely the same 144,000 servants in Revelation, and they are called the fullness of the Gentiles. They carry it, uh, a special category of Gentiles, they carry it to the house of Israel. That's clear from when you put all these pieces together that are in these chapters, don't you? Okay. Yeah. It ties right in with Isaiah. Yeah. So, so I like I liked what you said that the the father is like personally getting involved. That's kind of the way it it looks like. I've tried to at at some point last year I tried to go through the scriptures and identify like the different missions that were sort of allocated to each member of the Godhead, which was really kind of a fascinating look to say like whose mission is this? And so you know missions of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and I don't remember how many there were. I know there were like 17 I came up with for the Holy Ghost, which was eye-opening because um, we we really only ever talk about a few things uh, in terms of like, well, that's that's the role of the Holy Ghost to testify of the Father and the Son. But there's like quite a few things that the Holy Ghost does. And so when I got to um, Heavenly Father, it's a pretty extensive list. And, you know, of course, it goes back into pre-mortality and that would be um, like where the first covenants were made before we even came here. And and so I love that, you know, these, these indications in these chapters are sort of like, you know, hey, the Father has commanded me to do this. The Father's commanded me to do this. And, and Christ is just the perfect example of always following the, his Father's will. And um, he indicates, you know, that... The father is now going to bear his arm, which it's interesting that, and and I don't I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Like in the on the one hand, the Lord bears his holy arm to gather his people, but then it says the father is going to bear his arm 
And mm. so it's like there, there's two different beings. What what does that look like? Okay, so know? um and and Paul talks about the covenant people, namely the Jews and all the house of Israel, as God's people whom he foreknew. He knew them before. And that term, to know, is a covenant term. In other words, it's a personal knowledge, as when Jesus says to the ten virgins, to some, I don't know you, or you don't know me, but to the others, he knows them because they are they, they are his elect. And so, in other words, the Jews, or the natural lineage of Israel, yes, indeed, they must have had some kind of covenant relationship that took them to a certain spiritual level before they came here. And that is why they are so, so the apple of his eye, they're so precious to him. And, and others who are of mixed lineage or assimilated into the Gentiles as the Ephraimites were, we the Ephraimite Gentiles, you know, we, not have, we don't have that pure lineage. Um, there was another thing that you were just mentioning. I, I lost track of it. The difference between the father and the son bearing their arms. Oh, correct. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. God bearing his arm. God, Isaiah, God has two arms. And the arm of righteousness and the arm of salvation. And so indeed, the father has, the arm of righteousness is identified as a servant. He's called righteousness as one of his names. He personifies righteousness and he an exemplar of righteousness. And all those who've studied Isaiah know this. And the other arm is salvation, which is Jesus himself, Yeshua, whose name means salvation. So, and the two arms signify intervention when things get bad enough in today's world, then God starts intervening through his arms. First, the arm of righteousness, so that righteousness can be established among the people, you know, as, as a spiritual attribute. Um, and then secondly, when they already have a sufficient level of righteousness, then salvation, the Lord in person, who personifies salvation, can come in person, as he did to the people of Enoch, after they established righteousness. So, so the one is a forerunner of the other. So righteousness is established, and then salvation can come, as Isaiah says, in, in that sequence. But I think there's more to this because the Father's intervention or the Father's presence is really significant. Because look back at the um, look back at the Nephi disciples of Jesus, right? Nine wanted to go to Jesus' kingdom to join him there when their life was you know was over and had reached a good old age. But the three wanted to continue to bring souls to Jesus, like John the Revelator did. He was translated. And because of that, so long as the world shall stand, that was a huge sacrifice in their part. Because that is not easy for all, all that time to continue bringing souls to Jesus upon the earth when you could be enjoying heavenly realms, you know. <laughs> so, um, but they, they covenanted to do that. And then Jesus said, well, they would have a fullness of joy and be even as he, and they would inherit all the, basically the Father's kingdom. So now we have the Father's intervention in the world because those three Nephites were translated and given the seeing power because some of the Ephraimite Gentiles, who are the, going to be the spiritual kings and queens who minister the gospel to the house of Israel, are going to be translated. They're going to be given power over the elements, as Isaiah talks about. Um, and as Enoch had, um, to wade through the difficulties of the end times, through the gathering, through through a time when the world is being is self-destructing, when the great horror of all the earth is being punished, and the wicked are going into destruction, all celestial beings upon the earth um, are being destroyed, and then these elect are going to be gathered out. The elect of the house of Israel, the natural bodies, are going to be gathered out. We go after back into the orange the olive tree, um, and become his people again and inherit Jerusalem and inherit promised lands in this country and the Americas that were promised to Lehi. And so, of course, the father has to be involved because these are like the three Nephites, and they're, they became, says, as the angels of God who gathered the elect. So in order for for that to happen, the father has to be involved because of it, because of their translated state. They answer directly to the father. Um, the nine answered directly to Jesus. 
Mm. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a differentiation between even the elect and the translated beings <clears throat> who lead them in the new exodus out of Babylon to lands of inheritance. So what, a, what, a, what an amazing and huge scenario that is. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So what what is the uh, what is the relationship then when when um, I don't know if you can turn to a scripture on that concept, but translated beings answering to the Father instead of the Son. That's an interesting thought. Well, yes. So there are different degrees of glory, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So you have the celestial, the terrestrial, and the telestial. The Holy Ghost ministers in the telestial, witnessing to people that the gospel is true or that some something they read is true or, or it's not true. And the Son ministers in the terrestrial kingdom, which is a paradisical state, um, uh, which the millennium will be. So Jesus comes to reign during the millennial age to the new paradise that covers the entire earth eventually. And then at the end of that thousand years of terrestrial time, <clears throat> not celestial time, then the earth is fully transformed into a celestial glory. And so those who don't keep up with that uh, will have to go somewhere else. But those who do keep up with it will eventually all inherit the Father's kingdom. But that's evidently where it's going. Yeah. Okay, but during the during the millennium, we will all be in a translated state, right? Uh, not all, I believe. Uh, that we be, well, maybe not all. Uh, yeah. Well, at some point we will be after we attain that spiritual level. Okay. But it se it yeah. seems to be it seems to be it, there will be translated beings. Yes, of course, the ones who um, are translated in the end time. And <clears throat> if you look at the backstories backstories of those who are translated, then you see that they they made huge covenantal commitments over and above to the utmost sacrifice of everything. And like I mentioned the other day on on a show, if you want to inherit all that the Father has, then you have to sacrifice all that all that you are, all, all that you can be. You know, there's no other way around it. It's lecture six on lectures on faith by the Prophet Joe Smith talks about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Right now, uh, you know, in these in these passages in uh, Third Nephi talks about how the Gentiles are um, sort of over the house of Israel. And that's kind of by virtue of the house of Israel has not yet been gathered. And so they're kind of under the um, thumb of the different nations in which they live, right? So in in the gathering, as uh, that comes about, you you talked about this rapid reversal of circumstances. Can you explain a little bit about the the rapid reversal, how that will take place? Yes. Well, when we follow these chapters to their conclusion in Third Nephi twenty one, where Jesus speaks about his servant, uh, and you put it together with Third Nephi sixteen and Third Nephi twenty, and all the abominations and sins of the of the Gentiles, after they have received the gospel and through all these horrible things, think, really, us? Yeah, it's us. But it doesn't culminate. Those things are beginning, but they don't culminate until the Lord sends his servant. And what does the servant do? Well, the servant comes along to Isaiah. His mission is universal from the get-go. It's to all nations. And Jesus says he brings forth his words to the Gentiles. So his First of all, his mission is to the Gentiles, as Isaiah says. He's called to the to the Gentiles, which Jesus is not, never was. Uh, he says his mission is to the house of Israel. So you have to define what that is. And so the servant comes to the Gentiles, and Jesus said in 35, 21, he brings forth Jesus' words to the Gentiles. Well, where are, the, where are Jesus' words? Well, you look in, what is it, 35, 26. And there you see that Jesus explains the beginning of the world to the end to the Nephites and explains them in great detail. All the scriptures relating to them, I guess. It probably took a long time. 
<laughs> but um, those words were written down, and Mormon was not was forbidden to write them, and so was Moronite to write them to give them to the Gentiles. And so, where are they? Well, they are on the large plates of Nephi, still, until we learn to um, not take lightly the things we have received, which include the words of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. And when we believe the things that are in the Book of Mormon and believe and understand them and live them, when enough of us do that at least, then we'll receive the greater things that they've been forbidden to give us. And who does that? Well, the servant does. And so by the time the servant comes along and seeks to give the words of Christ in 30, on the large place of Nephi to the Gentiles, enough of the Gentiles must at least have believed and not taken lightly the Book of Mormon and lived it and so forth and become through repentance sufficiently righteous so they could inherit and receive those records, those additional records. And, and, but at the very time when a lot of the Gentiles who have, you know, who, who, who received the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith are then are, by then are, you know, are, are corrupting themselves and, and performing all those sins that Jesus enumerates there in these chapters and, and, and so there's then that dichotomy that Nephi talks about. On the one hand, on the other, there are those who harden their hearts among the Gentiles, and there are those who, who repent, who become known as the saints of God. And, and so the salvation of the house of Israel, of the Jews, ten tribes, and Lamanites of today, the salvation for them is that these saints, or these uh, Gentiles who repent, who believe the records that the servant brings forth, they become saving ministers or proxy saviors to the house of Israel. And they, they would be the same servants in, in, in Zenos' alley of the olive tree in Jacob 5, who graft the natural branches back into the olive tree. And when all of that profit process happens and the, tree, the trees begin bearing fruit again, all four, all four trees, the mother tree and the three branches trees, are all bearing bad fruit in order for the Lord to intervene through his servant and make that possible, that whole grafting process. And when they do bring, bring forth fruit, then is, then is the time that corresponds with Christ's second coming, which is the coming of Jehovah to reign upon the earth in the book of Isaiah. Same thing. <laughs> so so we, we have this amazing mission agenda waiting for us, waiting for us to fulfill, basically. And uh, Isaiah is is central part of it's front, back and center of the whole process, and we've got to understand Isaiah in order to to know how to do that, to learn that that calling that's required of us as birthright Ephraimites among the Gentiles. Yeah, hmm. amazing. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I feel I feel very fortunate to be on the earth. At this time, it's it is an exciting time to be here. Although, you know, it's also there's plenty of uh, scary stuff happening. That uh, you know, when the Lord said men's hearts will fail them, you can see why with all the things that are going on. The, the world is upside down right now, so um, crazy stuff happens. Um, I've got a couple of questions here from from people that uh, are listening in. Um, David asks, will a Gentile church hand over the keys of ecclesiastical authority to another institution that represents the house of Israel when the gathering of Israel is complete and Zion is built? Yeah, it's um, when things were moved, you know, trans transition rather to the kingdom of God on the earth, then we will know that, you know, I... I have this mantra that says, you know, if you can't show it from the scriptures, don't say it. And so there's no scripture that points specifically to that. But I assume that there is a transition from a celestial level where people need to start keep repenting and repenting. And so, uh, which is the, the lesser portion of the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ, repentance and baptism for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost, which all those who survive into the in the millennial age will already have then, right? So um 
so they will continue to progress another way. Um, because all the celestial people on the earth will be gone. That's what the, Joseph Smith's definition of, of the, uh, the end of the world was, that um, it's the destruction of the wicked. And those are the celestial people who, after given, being given a warning through the servant and other servants, present servants who are warning us about repenting, um, they, you know, they don't take heed. So the time comes when there's a, it's, it's beyond the point of no return and the judgment of God has to happen. So no getting around it. Yeah, I think uh, fourth Nephi is the, uh, is where it's all recorded, but they kind of shorten that 200 years into a couple of verses talking about we lived after the manner of happiness. And, and so I guess we'll know when we get there. We, we don't have a very good uh, picture of what that future looks like yet. But I think we know what to do now because it's given us mm -hmm. to do, to know what to do now. And when we do, when you do what we know to do now, then those other things will <clears throat> naturally unfold to us, to our understanding. And we can't know it all ahead of time because we are all required to act on faith and take the leap of faith into, um, into, you know, unknown territory sometimes to, to fulfill the things that God is asking us to fulfill. Yeah. What about, um, okay, we've got uh, another question came in from a different David. Um, if we are not all part of the house of Israel, who is? Uh, he says, it seems to me it would be extremely rare if each one of us is not directly related to one or many of the original tribes of Israel when considering the many generations and mixing of genes. So if I were to guess, I would say we're, that whether we are of the house of Israel or not would be very difficult to say. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree. I think it seems like we'd be hard pressed to find a pure non-Israelite in the world today. Uh, do you think? Yes. Yes. Likely so, because the house of Israel was scattered all among all nations, right? That's what we hear. So yeah. to a greater or lesser degree, all nations can claim Israelite lineage. But we have to pay respect to what the scriptures say and not uh, put our own spin on them. And when the scriptures, like the Book of Mormon, identify the house of Israel, look look up house of Israel in the Book of Mormon, follow it all the way through. Who, who is it talking about? The Jews, the Ten Tribes, or the Nephites or Lamanites, you know, or, or those the Mulekites include. Um, it's not talking about those to whom the gospel is restored, and it's not talking about them as the house of Israel, and it's talking about, which is us, and, and, and it's talking specifically of a category, category called the fullness of the Gentiles, which when you, when you see what, you know, J Jacob's blessing on Ephraim's head, when his left hand on Ephraim's head, he called him, his offspring is, is given the patriarchal blessings of all the end time, all of them were. His his offspring shall become the fullness of the Gentiles. Uh, Romans eleven, Paul uses that expression to of us again of the of the gospel going to the Gentiles, and uh, it appears in in First Nephi and in Third Nephi. Uh, Jesus uses it again. We've got to define our roles and not just assume well we're of the house of Israel. So no, it doesn't work that way. We've got to figure out what the scriptures are saying through searching them diligently. And then once we learn that and the Spirit testifies to us, then we we can be empowered. God will empower us to continue uh, to, in our understanding. But with the doing comes the understanding. And with just talking about it, without the doing, the understanding cannot come. You know, We can speculate about this, that, or the other, but it's not going to help us or anyone. It causes confusion. So, I mean, essentially, as we study, like you said, we've got to do, we have to be doers of the word. But essentially, uh, what the Lord has given us through Isaiah and the rest of the scriptures is uh, a roadmap to the uh, the greater portion. Uh, and that that's really what our goal is, is to um, learn to master the lesser portion and and follow the spirit into the greater portion so that we understand what our individual role and mission is in this whole scheme of things right 
Yes, you, you, you expressed that so beautifully, a roadmap to the greater portion. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard it expressed quite that way. But that's what it is. It's been inspired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the words of Isaiah are that. The Book of Mormon is that. Uh, yeah. There, there's such a wealth there. And unless we're totally immersed in those scriptures, we really can't get it either. It's, we've got to we've got to get a handle on, on the and and if, if once you understand Isaiah, it's the key to all the all the scriptures. Um uh, yeah, do it. <laughs> it's they're waiting for you. And we have the keys in the Isaiah Institute. We've provided the keys to do it, and many have. Many have done it. And you know, we keep getting thank yous from so many sources. Once that vision of Isaiah opens up, then all the scriptures become kind of transparent. When you say many have done it, what, what is it? Yeah. It is taking on searching the words of Isaiah diligently as Jesus commanded, which is not just studying or, or reading. It's a deliberate challenge to go deep into the layers of Isaiah. And the New Testament people did that, where it says they searched the scriptures daily to know whether those things were so. What they had been taught, they had to determine for themselves from the scriptures, not just wait for somebody to tell them, like I'm telling here or somebody else is telling, you know. The only way you can get it really is that way. And so that's why it is a commandment uh, to search the words of Isaiah. No other prophet is names whose words we need to search. The, search the prophets, yes, but not one specifically. Isaiah, calling his words great. Um, yeah, truly are, truly are great. Once you get into that, you realize it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I, I've gone through a lot of your material and I, I love it and have learned a lot. And it, it, it's true. Once you start to have that open up, um, everything else just sort of fits into place. It's like Isaiah is the, the summation of the house of Israel. And, and then you just start to see like pre-mortality, mortality, the gathering. Everything fits. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's it's amazing. Um, all right, here's an, here's another question. Uh, Chauncey asks: So, aren't the natural branches being grafted into the mother tree right now? Isn't that what the gathering is all about? No, it's not. Uh, the gathering hasn't happened yet. Um, a kind of a yeah, it's kind of a I don't know what to call it. Um, no. You, once you get into Isaiah, you see that the gathering happens in these chapters of Third Nephi. At the time, the house of Israel believes in Jesus and calls upon the Father in his name. That's when the gathering happens. And it happens in a physical, literal, new exodus, like the exodus out of Egypt, out of Babylon. And Babylon being the world on the eve of its destruction. And who does that? It's instigated through the servant when he comes and through the 144,000 servants who have their equivalent in the book of Isaiah. And they're called the kings and queens of the Gentiles and also called the watchmen uh, in Isaiah. There are three names, servants, kings and queens of the, spiritual kings and queens of the Gentiles and watchmen. And spiritual kings and queens speaks to their um, proxy salvation role. Their proxy saviors by taking upon themselves others' burdens and others' iniquities they're able to obtain the physical deliverance of those to whom they minister. And so that happens when the house of Israel starts through their ministry, begins believing in Jesus, calling upon the Father in his name, and then they come in a physical exodus, and they walk through the fire and through the rivers and through the mountain ranges and waters. Um, that's, the, that's the gathering of Israel right there, according to Isaiah. And it's also called his great and marvelous work which is, again, not the restoration of the priesthood and the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith. When you define it and analyze it in the, Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, it is part of the, it is actually the restitution or restoration of all things, all 12 tribes of Israel. And it happens at the time the great abominable church, which is the equivalent of the harlot of Babylon in Isaiah and the Book of Revelation. Uh, only Nephi couldn't call it the Babylon because Babylon was still a, a political power in his day. And that's when, when the saints are, and the covenant people of the Lord are coming under attack by the harlot. And then the way it happens is, is 
is this, okay, we have God's covenant people, and when a people make a covenant with God or have a covenant with God, if they keep the terms of the covenant, which are his commandments, then he, he showers them with all kinds of blessings. The main blessings are, you know, uh, a promised land, posterity, and divine protection, physical protection. But when others, um, but, but let's say they, they keep the commandments, and so they're not incurring any covenant curses that are also part of the covenant. The covenants always have a, a cursed side or cursing side. Um, for those who don't keep the terms of the covenant, they, God curses them with different situations that are awful. And um, But when somebody threatens the very life or mortality of those who are keeping the terms of the covenant, then the curses of those people, of, of those who have the covenant with God, come upon, those, come upon their enemies and destroy them. Now, I'm not sure if you're following me, but I'll repeat it one more time so it's really clear. When you're following God's commandments, keeping the laws of his covenant, and you're receiving his blessings, and your enemies come against you to destroy you, then the curses of your covenant with the Lord come upon your enemies. And that is what happens where Nephi talks about the great and abominable church. That is when the, that, there is that great reversal of circumstances that happens when God empowers his saints and the covenant people of the Lord. And, and basically, the, you know, the, the anti-Zion forces then go, go to hell. They, they are destroyed. They destroy themselves. Yeah. That's when that happens. So in other words, evil is going to continue in, increasing upon the, in, upon the earth until the very lives of God's people are threatened. And that is when the great reversal finally happens overnight. And that's when the, the gathering of Israel happens from the four directions of the earth to lands of inheritance. That's all scriptural. That's all in the scriptures, just as I've stated it. Look it up for yourself. Is this the, not the transition from uh, fishers to hunters? Yes, it is. The hunters are those servants of God uh, who graft in the natural branches who 144,000 servants, the saviors on Mount Zion in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, um, the servants in Isaiah, the called the watchmen or the spiritual kings and queens of the Gentiles. They're the ones who graft in the natural branches. They're the ones who carry them on their shoulders and their arms to Zion. Through the wilderness, through, in a call-out situation, from all over the earth, and because they have the power over the elements, they can walk through the fire when led by these individuals, these translated beings, and who are these translated beings? Well, we are, or we're supposed to be, or some of us have to become that, you know, in order to do that work. There's always progression in this beautiful ladder of Isaiah, spiritual ladder. There's, you know, there's a Jacob Israel category, kind of a pivotal category. And you either go up down to Babylon or you go up to Zion, the uh, Zion Jerusalem level, and beyond that, the uh, son servant level, which is an elect level celestial level, and beyond that there is the seraphim level, or the, the level of translated beings, right? like the three Nephites, who are as the angels of God, it says, of them. In 3 Nephi 28, I think it is. Yeah, and above them is Jehovah, and above him, there is the Most High God, who is the Father. Yeah, so, it's just an incredible, incredible, you know, prospect to participate in these events. It's glorious. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it is it is an exciting time to to be here and to see these things happening and and like uh, the scriptures tell us in the days that Isaiah's prophecies would be fulfilled we would know what they were it's like so clear like some of the yeah. things that are happening yeah. today it's <laughs> it, it there's no doubt that uh, mm -hmm. those are real prophecies um, right. okay. here's another question that came in from uh, Doug. Has not the current mentality amongst Gentile Western world peoples of ultra sensitivity to racism, um, has this not made it prohibitive to actually speak of Israel without recognizing God made a distinction among the families of the earth? I'm not sure if you can. Um, yes, I'm kind of getting the trend of that one. Okay. Because I, I know, like, the thought came to me earlier when you were talking a little about. Um, something else you know in deuteronomy or, or somewhere it talks about how god divided the nations 
you know, before we were born. He, he That's knew where each of the nations would be, he knew where we would belong. And so there's a, this pre-mortal mapping, I guess, of, uh, you know, where each of us belong. And, and so I don't know if you can address Doug's question a little bit on, on this. Yeah, well, it, it is thus because, because not all of God's children are on the same spiritual level, right? And the idea is to progress up the spiritual ladder by embracing more of God's law and living it and going through your descent phase of testing on each level, keeping the law of God pertaining to covenants on that spiritual level, and then moving beyond that um, through a descent phase of being tested through trials and, and your loyalties and so forth, and then experiencing spiritual rebirth to the next level, um, and going, then going through an even deeper descent of trials as you as you be, learn to live and keep higher laws pertaining to a higher covenant, like the Davidic covenant, where you become a proxy savior to others, and beyond that to ascend to a to a translated state, the descent is even greater before the ascent of rebirth to another great higher level. And then, of course, Jesus, whom we emulate in all this process, is the one who descended below all to ascend to his Father's throne. So he too was keeping God's law on that, on the level of Godhood, and he ascended to his Father's throne to inherit all that the Father has at that point. He says, "On the third day, I will be." He said, "This day, today, see, today and tomorrow, I'm busy again." I do miracles and cast out devils. I said, on the third day, I should be perfected. And that perfection was his atonement of that test and trial that he went through of atoning for this world's transgression. And before that, he was not perfect on the level of the Father. That's why he would say, in Jerusalem, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But in the American context, he said, be, be perfect as I and your Father in heaven are perfect because now he could say that after his atonement. After he atoned for this world's transgression. When you when you examine all these things in great detail, you see it's all there. It's this whole process of ascent on a spiritual ladder is all there. And it keeps going beyond this world, of course. It's yeah, we're showing this much so far. I think uh, you know, in the scriptures it talks about a first estate and a second estate. Uh, but it it seems to me that you know each each step up is is sort of like an estate like there there would be a third estate a fourth estate and so on yes that- yeah there is um keeps going and um I, I wrote something up about that recently it's in our isaiah institute newsletter um under previous blogs so you can find it there it's in four, four parts but look even before going back to your earlier point even before we came here People come down to this earth on different spiritual levels to get certain increments of growth. If we were all on the same level, then it wouldn't be a test. But some are on higher and some are on lower levels. Some are like greater noble ones like Abraham, who are the leaders or the, the judges or the you know the rulers, spiritual rulers upon the earth. And and then the and they're called souls. And what does soul mean? It's body and spirit. So what are the souls do coming down? to do that. And then there are other spirits and intelligences, you know. And when you look at near-death experiences, and, and a few of which are incorrect or implausible, but there are many that are that are sincere, people who have near-death experiences, who have seen these things, who have seen a lot of these things. And they come down here to get this particular increment of growth, spiritual growth, before they move on. And that's what they were meant to do here. And so they do it, and then somehow in a you know in a post-mortal situation that God knows of, I'm sure they can continue to increase increments of growth until finally they can ascend all the way, all the way to wherever they want to go, if they're willing to pay the price. Again, it's a glorious program. It's yeah. the, fullness, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There wouldn't be much growth if we just put celestial people on a world. <laughs> It'd be like, right. okay, we're, we're all acting good. <laughs> There's not yeah. a lot of opposition there. So No, yeah. we grow through ministering to others. Yeah. yeah. What and about through the, things, through the things we suffer? Suffer and service are the things that sanctify and perfect us. 
Yeah. Um, going along with the uh, question earlier from uh, Chauncey, which was on the natural branches being grafted back into the mother tree, and uh, isn't that what's going on? A follow up to that is then why does President Nelson say it's the most important thing happening right now to gather Israel if if that's not really what's happening? And my my quick interjection there would be, um, it seems that right now we're still in the fisher stage. We haven't transitioned to the hunter stage. And so it is important. Obviously, doing missionary work is important, but um, there will come a time when there's a transition to that. Is that? Yeah. Well, basically, fair? like... Like you read in, in the journal of discourses, where the early brethren spoke about this, and they said, "Right now we're gathering Ephraim. When Ephraim becomes strong enough and big enough to, to do this, the birthright role, like Joseph in Egypt, who is a savior to his brethren, temporally, but we we are to do it spiritually to the house of Israel. Then then things shift, yeah, and they shift when the servant comes. That's when they shift toward paying attention to the house of Israel." That's why I say in these chapters, these chapters 30 by 16, 20, and 21, if you care to read them, examine them, search them, because it tells you in plain terms what happens there. Uh, and so th there is a reversal of circumstances happening. Last will be first and first will be last. The olive trees, before this before the grafting process even begins, why does the grafting process happen in the first place? Because all four trees, the mother tree and the three daughter trees, who are the Jews, ten tribes, and Le Lehi's descendants, and some say there are four, but no, you haven't read correctly. Um, but all the four trees are bearing corrupt fruit. None of it's any good. And so that's when the Lord intervenes through his arm, through his servant, who is the arm of God, the arm of righteousness, who comes as an exemplar of righteousness and establishes righteousness among at least a certain group of Gentiles so that they can go out and gather the rest of Israel as these kings and queens of the Gentiles, spiritual kings and queens. Yeah. So that's, you know, I can't answer for President Nelson, and I can't answer for, for anything that other than what these scriptures are saying. These scriptures are very explicit about these things. Isaiah is, the Book of Mormon is. The Book of Mormon prophets were waiting. They're almost holding their breath for these Gentiles to come along, these kings and queens of the Gentiles, and graft, you know, basically graft their descendants back into the olive tree or back into God's covenant people. We are, we are their hope. They're looking to us to do that for their descendants. And so they were, you know, it's, it's been so long. And the, at the end of it all, there is hope because when the Gentiles reject it, it has to go back to the house of Israel. And when the house of Israel is ready for it, who's going to take it to them? Well, those among the Gentiles who believe these things, who take on this role of, of gathering the house of Israel physically, spiritually by converting them, as it says, of the 144,000, to bring as many as they can to the church of the firstborn, who are God's elect, or just men made perfect, and then, then they are worthy to be gathered in an exodus. As Jesus said, he will send his angels. They will gather his elect from the four winds. When? Well, just before his coming, when the world is being destroyed. And why is it being destroyed? Because the Gentiles have rejected the fullness of the gospel sometime after they have received it. I'm not making this up. It's all there. And it's, it's all falling in, into place now. And the sign in the heavens and everything, these are all you know, pointing us in that direction. These chapters, Third Nephi, are so explicit about it all. How long? It's not, it's not the time of Joseph Smith. It's the end time that Isaiah is. The book of Isaiah is, is an end time scenario, as I show from the literature chapters that I analyzed. And Jesus is totally right about that. And so are Nephi and Jacob. You can't deny their words. You can't just you know, try to uh, superimpose your own preformed belief into this scenario. It doesn't work. Yeah, these are scriptures. These are the words of Christ. Yeah. Somebody else asked here about the Exodus. You just mentioned that. Um, is there any kind of time frame? I don't know how, if we have a, a sense of 
how long the exodus will take um because th there's not really a, a time frame on that is there this person asks uh will the last great exodus last three years during the time of the king of assyria destroying the wicked is it yes is there yeah. about a three-year time span then yes isaiah says isaiah talks about three years of warning and that is through his servant mm. um and he talks about this year um eat what uh this year, eat basically what you've prepared or something. Next year, eat what goes wild. He talks about a three-year interval where we go into the wilderness and we keep alive a sheep and a, you know, uh, we keep alive a, a heifer or a cow and a pair of sheep, something like that. So, yeah, we go into a wilderness situation for a time. And I think the Jews do too. And I think it's not in their current present land. They may go back to the Sinai wilderness where they were before in their call-out. But all the house of Israel goes in a call-out. And there they stay for a time, and and that the wilderness in which they stay regenerates. So it already seems to be that a terrestrial time zone there occurs there, and that the earth starts regenerating to a paradisical state, even in the wilderness, because that is also a time when their bodies are healed, and the lame leap for joy, and the deaf hear, and so forth, and all the impairments that they have, physical impairments disappear. So it's a time of regeneration, a wonderful time to look forward to. David asks, um, it, we've mentioned fishers and hunters a couple of times. I think uh, some people may not know that reference. It, it comes from Jeremiah 16, 16. It says, behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So, the question was asked, do fishers draw in, do hunters chase away, which, you know, they're all, they're all gathering. But do you want to talk about the difference between that uh, fisher and hunter? Well, only, only what uh, Jeremiah is saying, which is kind of obvious to me, that fishing is what we're doing now, or have been doing all this time since the restoration of the gospel. Through the prophet Joey Smith, the time will come when that's not sufficient, you know. Um, according to Isaiah's end time scenario, uh, we have to go out there and find these people. We're directed, the kings and queens of the Gentiles have to go out there and, and find them and pull them in. And because they all had the same vision of the end from the beginning, they know exactly where to go and which people they need to gather. The Lord will tell them there, tell them that. And so they'll, they'll each one will have his assigned body of, of uh, elect to gather, I suppose, from among the nations of the world. They come from the four directions of the world. Yeah. 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 Okay. So another person asks, in modern missionary terms, are we now engaged in gathering the gatherers? I think that's probably a fair statement. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So, um, so, um, so, so the restoration of the gospel, which through the prophet Joseph Smith is called the beginning or the commencement or the foundation by definition of the great and marvelous work. So that tells you that it's, it's still in the beginning stage. We're still in the beginning stage. Until, until the actual physical gathering happens, which is preceded by a division among the Gentiles, those who are cut off from the people, as, as uh, Jesus says in 3 Nephi 21 and 22, I think. Um, <clears throat> they're cut off from among the people because they would not believe his words. So there's a, there's a division that happens, and only those who remain, I, I guess, who are the, these on a, on a higher spiritual level, they will... They will do the gathering, the physical, spiritual, and physical gathering. So the whole, the whole, um, you know, the uh, <clears throat> yeah. I, I'm getting old and I forget words. <laughs> the whole <laughs> dynamic of the of the gathering changes at some point very dramatically. It's sort of like uh, right now. We, we're tossing out lures like we're fishing. Like yeah. maybe a fish will see this uh, attractive lure and uh, get reeled in into the gospel net or whatever but in the coming day it'll be more like hey there's there's somebody we need to go rescue and and you're hunting them you know out of the mountains and uh yes yeah you'll be showing yeah mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> excuse me um 
So I've got a question here. Can you talk to the Davidic servant being a sort of physical Messiah for the Jews, even while Christ is truly the only Messiah? Or did I misunderstand that? So Michael's just wondering about that relationship there. Yes. And can we make that the last question? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, as I'm also giving a question and answer session for an hour or more at our Isaiah Institute conference on, on March 30th. Um, so yeah, that there, there is that uh, belief that the Jews have, and it's a correct belief, in a Latter-day David. And it's in Isaiah, it's in Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and others. We speak about a David, and so does Joseph Smith and Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 339. We raise up in the last days of David's lineage, called David. And um, he's the one that the Jews have looked to as their Messiah, um, not realizing that the Lord Jehovah, as Abinadi taught <laughs> to the priests of King Noah, would be their Messiah. The Son of God would be a Messiah. And so they never expected a Son of God to come and be a Messiah like that, like Jesus came. Not that kind of Messiah, but one who would temporarily save them from the Romans. And, well, according to the words of Isaiah, but uh, way too soon, way earlier than it was predicted to be. And so um, they are waiting for that person still. But once they realize, which now a, a sizable group of Messianic Jews over in Israel are recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah, they, they are no longer looking for that letter to David come. And so in a way, they too are at fault because the Latter-day David is still going to come as well and prepare the way for his, his second coming. He's the arm of righteousness. He's sent to the Gentiles first. And when, the, when they mar or disfigure him and Jesus needs to heal him or translate him, then he, then he goes to, to the Jews as well and does things over there. So in fulfillment of what the Jews were expecting, at least, you know, so just as the Jews got it wrong, though, when when Jesus came along and did not expect him, so we follow Brigham Young's reasoning that the Gentiles will be just as mistaken about his second coming as the Jews were about his first coming, then we are going to get it wrong, expecting just simply Jesus to, to come along, which he's not going to in that way. Um, because first of all, we're going to get his servant, David, to prepare the way before him, the ones the Jews were fulfilling. Or expecting, I mean, to, uh, to fulfill the messianic role. So, <laughs> so it's all going to be a test of faith as it was for the Jews. It's going to be a test of faith for us when he comes along. And many who are not prepared spiritually, who don't know the prophecies of Isaiah or what the Book of Mormon is really telling us, or read the chapters of Isaiah in which Nephi is trying to tell us things that he could not see in vision himself. And we don't understand those chapters of Isaiah that he's quoting and by what he means by that. And, and don't see things in context and so forth, but want to just proof text about to support this belief of ours or that belief of ours, we're going to get it wrong. And so a lot of us will be cut off, as Jesus said in 35, 21, from being his people because we are not ready to receive the greater things yet. So and now since it's getting so close with 2024, and again, the, the sign of the eclipse crossing us out, and yeah, I think it's high time that we dived in and get a handle on Isaiah. Yeah, I I constantly have in mind the the talk President Nelson gave in uh, April 2016, where he said we have to seek to be taught by the Lord Himself, and and what that invitation implies. And I think you know we've had so many warnings that unless we are spiritually in tune, uh, we, we are not going to survive what's coming. And so and Jesus and, and, and uh, Nephi in his last major address on the doctrine of Christ in uh, second Nephi 32. Um, yeah. He, he basically says that in so many words. Yeah. Um, basically read the scriptures, uh, feast on the words of Christ, which are in the scriptures. Um, for they will tell you all things what you should do. Okay, number one. So when you start doing all the things that you should do from, from what you know or read in the scriptures and start living them, then he, the next step is get the Holy Ghost because it will tell you all things what you should do. 
Well, that's a higher step because the Holy Ghost can tell you more than just the Word of God can tell you, you know, because He can talk to you directly. And then the next very verse says, uh, when Jesus manifests Himself to you, He will tell you what to do. So yes, there's this progression. And maybe people who are so inured to living the lesser law and saying that's the fullness of the gospel when it's not, these are just basic principles of the law of God. It's not enough. It's not enough for what's coming. We need to be in touch with so in touch with Jesus that we can speak to him through the veil and we hear his voice through the veil and we see manifestations of him. As we do so and live righteously, he will manifest himself to us in no uncertain terms. And I testify of that. I have a sure testimony of it. God knows I do. Well, thank you, Abraham. We really appreciate your time uh, today in uh, addressing some of these questions and I'm uh, excited about the upcoming conference. Do you want to touch on that again real quick? The um, I know people can go to uh, bookofmormonisaiah.com slash join to sign up for the conference that's coming up on the 30th. Are you asking me? Sorry. I was oh, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> if you want to just, because we've had a lot of people that have uh, signed on to the webinar that weren't here at the very beginning when you talked about it. Do you want to oh, share? Yes. yes, you can go to... Um, the website isaiahinstitute.com and or bookofmormonisaiah.com either of those two websites and there you can sign up for our second Isaiah Institute conference on the 30th of March Saturday um, all day Saturday event morning afternoon well not all day but most of the day um, morning afternoon and evening evening question and answer session with me a long one and um and for this conference, which is called uh, a day of reckoning, so the one, so this is going to be basically on the day of the Lord or the day of judgment that's coming upon the world, and I'm going to discuss it from Isaiah. Others are discussing it from Doctrine and Covenants, from Jer from Revelation, and from the Book of Mormon. So we're going to kind of cover that whole field of God's day of judgment that's coming upon the world, which is nigh at hand with the sign of the eclipse and so forth, um, as as fully as six speakers can do it on that day. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> right. Well, thank you again, Abraham. And uh, sorry, everybody, we weren't able to get to all the questions, uh, mm -hmm. but search Isaiah, right? <laughs> so, do it. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Abraham. We're, Appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it too.